hear my son and receive my words. And the years of your life shall be many. That's uh, today's wisdom. Today's wisdom piece, that's Proverbs 4.10. So we're coming to the end of the Lenten season. Uh, Man, it's been quite a freaking uh, journey. Uh, This is a holy week. Uh, Today's Holy Thursday. It's the day that Jesus washed the feet of his uh, apostles. I was talking to my daughter this morning and sharing them with her. And she really didn't understand the significance of the washing of the feet. And so, you know, back, you know, back in the day, back then, uh, you know, they didn't have shoes like we got shoes today. You know, they had sandals, you know, some had sandals. You walked in dirt. Your your feet were the filthiest part of your entire body. I mean, dirt, sweat. Who knows if you stepped in feces? Like, who knows, you know? So imagine the humility that it takes for someone to touch someone's feet. You know, I think it was, you know, kings and whatnot would make you kiss their feet. I mean, just imagine that. And so, like, she's she's being she, she's grossed out as I'm as I'm kind of breaking this all down, but. Um, I said, you know, Christ completely humiliated himself, lowered himself um, in service to to his men, to the gang of his better men. And so that's an example for us to follow. It's an example for me to follow. It's an example for you to follow. And it was Christ demonstrating that, look, I didn't come here to lord my power over you. I came here to serve you. Like, I mean, think of other, look at today. Look at today how people are lording their power over us. They're, when, in fact, they should be here to serve us. Like, we have put people into power in this world. Um, we put them into power. They have no power. I won't get into that tangent. <laughs> but, you know, Christ ultimately humiliated himself, you know. And so we're coming to the end of the Lenten season. Uh, tomorrow is Good Friday. It's the day that Jesus is crucified. But here's an interesting thing. Here's what I want to share with you today. It's the it's the night that Jesus is betrayed. He washes the feet of the apostles. And then eventually uh, he is uh, he institutes the Eucharist. We're going to get into that. It's the Last Supper where Christ institutes the sacrament of the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist. And it's where ultimately he's betrayed after that night. He's arrested, and the next day he he goes through his passion. He suffers. He dies. Um, And that's what I want to share with you today. Betrayal. Um, So in today's wisdom, it says, Hear, my son. Hear, my son. As in, hear. Listen to me. Receive my words. And the years of your life shall be many. So St. Paul says that faith comes through hearing, right? Um, how many men grow up today without ever getting to hear the wise words of their father? Or maybe their father wasn't wise at all because maybe he didn't receive it from his father, right? Do men ever get to hear the wise words of their father? I know I didn't. And I was very fortunate to grow up with a stepfather. Yet he never really imparted any kind of wisdom um, to me. He provided, and that was about it. In today's, this, this Thursday evening, Christ gives us very specific words this weekend. Actually, tonight. He gives us very specific words. And it's exactly what I want to talk about today. So today's readings, the first one is from Isaiah. And he says, hear me, O islands. Like, again, I just find it so profound that as I go through these daily wisdom pieces, because I'm looking for knowledge, I'm, I'm seeking understanding Um, And through knowledge and understanding, you gain wisdom. 
and today's was here. Listen. And the first reading opens up with <laughs> opens up with hear me. Hear me, O islands, listen. O distant peoples, the Lord called me from birth. From my mother's womb, he gave me my name. He made me a sharp-edged sword and concealed me in the shadow of his arm. That part stood out to me there. He made me a sharp-edged sword. God called you, me, us from our mother's womb. He knew us before he formed us. And this is what I shared uh, in the Path of Destruction, the Path to Destruction episode. Where yesterday's wisdom piece, you know, I, I went, it, it started out with, uh, this was wisdom, actually the book of wisdom, chapter 2, verse 2, it says, For we, for by mere chance we were born, and hereafter we shall be as though we had not been. So, like, these people, and these people are the Jews, you know, Judah, they turned their back from God, right? So they began to lose hope. And they began to just go on this path of destruction to destroy the just one, right? Which is ultimately Christ's coming. Um, they had no hope. So they're like, ah, oh, what's the point? But here's the thing, man. You're not an accident. I'm not an accident. Right? According to Isaiah, the Lord called you and me from birth. He, he From our mother's womb, he gave us our name. And he made us a sharp-edged sword. That is a very important piece there. Think about a think about a sword. A sword has a purpose. A sword creates other tools. Right? It's it's probably the only tool that creates other tools. Right? You could be left out in the middle of the desert, which is where we've been the last 40 days. You can be left out in the middle of the wilderness and as long as you have a knife, you can survive. It's a tool that creates other tools. So you are called to creation. It is a tool that creates. It is a tool that defends. It is a tool that protects. And that is your purpose. That's one of your primary vocations. Uh, one of my primary vocations in this world is to create this is our our, poet, our our poetry, our art. And each of us have different skills, different talents, different types of art. Many men are called to fatherhood. Many men are not. And a sharp-edged sword, if necessary, is called to kill. Obviously, one of God's commandments is, thou shalt not kill. But there were many instances in the Bible where he supports the Jews in war, which ultimately leads ends with killing, right? But you, my friend, are a sharp-edged sword. So I want to continue here. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me. You are my servant, he said to me. Israel, through whom I show my glory. Though I thought I had toiled in vain and for nothing useless, spent my strength. Yet my reward is with the Lord. My recompense is with God. For now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as his servant from the womb. That Jacob may be brought back to him. And Israel gathered to him. And I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord. And my God is now my strength. It is too little, he says, for you to be my servant. To raise up the tribes of Israel. 
and restore the survivors to restore the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the far ends of the earth. That's the first reading, Isaiah uh, chapter 49, 1 through 6. I like what he says here. He says, it is too little for you to be my servant. We're not just called here to be God's servant. We're called here to do something. We're called to a purpose, right? The gospel gets really interesting. And I had a conversation with my spiritual mentor. Shout out to Rick. Gave me some clarity on this and it just really blew my mind. I'm just, I can't wait to share this with you. So this is from John uh, 13, 21, essentially 21 through 38. Uh, but it breaks it up into little pieces. And it's, it's essentially t- tonight, Thursday night. Holy Week, Judas betrays Jesus. It says, reclining at the table with his disciples, Jesus was deeply troubled and testified. Amen, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Anywhere in the Bible where it says, amen, amen, or truly, truly, like that is Jesus like doubling down, emphatically saying no. Because, you know, in the Bible, a lot of people say, oh, well, the Bible is up for interpretation. Well, no, that's incorrect. The Bible is not up for interpretation if you say that the bible is up for interpretation i mean that's why we have forty thousand different denominations of protestant christianity today because no one can agree on what the bible says god is not a polygamist there's one bride of christ one bridegroom one bride and so when we leave it up you know saying that the bible is up for interpretation what you're saying is is god is incapable he is incompetent actually of communicating his revelation to you, his word. So you just got to figure it out on your own. Imagine if we approached our laws that way. Well, shoot, we probably, we probably actually are. <laughs> can't even t- talk. We can't even, uh, we don't even know what a woman is. Um, imagine if we, if we ran our laws that way. Like, oh, here's the Constitution and... You know, with the spirit of George Washington, figure it out on your own. Like, what would happen if we tried to interpret the Constitution for our, for you know, in our own way, which, ironically, is actually happening today. Anyway, the Bible sometimes, you know, depends on what's you know, the Bible is a book of is a library of books, right? So depending on what section of the library you're in, you've got fiction, you've got nonfiction, you've got poetry, you've got all these different sections of the Bible. Depending on what section of the Bible you're in, it might be. It's going to be different. But there are very specific places where Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, or he'll say, amen, amen, I say to you. He's saying, dude, pay attention. Hear like what the wisdom said, you know, the wisdom piece for the day. Hear me. Pay attention. Hear me. Pay attention because what I'm about to drop on you is the absolute objective truth. So he says, amen, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another at a loss as to whom he meant. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter nodded to him to find out whom he meant. He leaned back against Jesus' chest and said to him, Master, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is the one whom I hand the morsel after I have dipped it. So he dipped the morsel and took it and handed it to Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot. After Judas took the morsel, Satan entered him. So Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now none of those reclining at the table realized what he had said to him. Some thought that since Judas kept the money bag, Jesus had told him, buy what we need for the feast or to give something to the poor. So Judas took the morsel and left it once and it was night. 
When he had left, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and as I told the Jews, where I go you cannot come. So now I say it to you. Simon Peter said to him, Master, where are we going? Where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I'm going, you cannot follow me, though you will later. Peter said to him, Master, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for me? Amen, amen, I say to you, the cock will crow. The cock will not crow before you deny me three times. So even Peter, our first pope, denies Jesus, betrays Jesus. It's his betrayal all over the place. And so, man, it, I started thinking, you know, after reading that, I was like, so hold on. <laughs> I had this conversation with my wife. I was like, wait a second. After Jesus gave the morsel to Judas, Satan entered him. So I'm like, did Jesus set up Judas? So just follow me here. I'm, do, I'm doing a thought. I've been, I've, been, I've been wrestling with this. I'm trying to do a thought process, trying to understand here. Is that why he created Judas, right? Jesus is God, you know, in the flesh. So it's like, is that why God created Judas to betray him? Was that Judas's ultimate purpose in this life? To betray Jesus. Because here's the thing. God is all-knowing, right? He's all-powerful. So does that mean that he created Judas for that purpose? Knowing. Knowing Judas would betray him. But what I'm wrestling with is, well, no, that can't be the case because God doesn't create people to fail. Because, you know, that whole conversation comes up with Hitler, right? Like, why would God create Hitler? Hitler, He knew Hitler was going to kill the Jews. He didn't create Hitler to, to kill the Jews. He created him to free the German people. But he didn't, right? Because we all get a choice. We all get a choice. So I'm like... Did God create Judas for the purpose? Because, like, somebody had to betray Jesus, right? Somebody had to kick this whole thing off. And let's just say, let's say God did create Judas for that purpose, which, you know, God doesn't create evil. He doesn't create those that do that do evil. So, but let's just say he did. Why would he do that? Because, you know, guess what? God created me, too. And I do a lot of evil. God created you, and I'm sure you've done evil. Did God create me knowing that I would betray him, that I would fall uh, to my passions, that I would uh, you know, do the evil things that I've done in my life? Like, why would, why? Why would God do that? Did God create me knowing that I would betray him only so he could save me. So he could prove his love for me. These are just thoughts that I'm having. Because to me, that's the only thing that makes sense. Because he, kn he knew Judas was going to make the decision to betray him. And so, you know, I'm sharing this with my wife, and she's like, no, that's, and, you know, she, I can't even, honestly, I can't recall exactly the, what we talked about. She's like, no, that's not possible. God would not do that. God would not create 
you know, that. And then I reached out to my spiritual mentor and he's like, no, God does not create people for failure. Um, and my wife actually shared with me a very interesting thought, um, a very, uh, yeah, she gave me some insight and I'd never really thought about this until now. And pretty interesting. Jesus gives Judas the morsel, right? So picture they're in the upper room. Jesus institutes the Eucharist. He talks about the body and, you know, the bread and how it's his body and blood. And I'm going to break down the Eucharist here in just a minute. So after he breaks the bread, blesses the bread, blesses the wine, he dips, he says, the, after I dip the morsel, so I'm assuming he dips the bread in the wine, and so this is the bread. And so he gives that morsel to Judas. So if that scene is correct, and I'm understanding this correctly, Judas was the first one to receive Holy Communion from Christ. He was the first one to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And so then I'm thinking, well, hold on, okay, if that is true, then why wouldn't Judas live forever? Because the teaching of the Catholic Church and the teaching of the Eucharist is that is that that is it. That is the summit. The Mass is the source and summit of our salvation, not the Bible. It's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. I'm going to break it down, what I mean. If you're not Catholic, some of this might not make sense. But hopefully the way I explain it, hopefully it will make sense. But, you know, and I'm going to read, you know, because, I mean, don't believe my words, believe the words of Christ that I'm going to you know, share with you here. This is John in the book of John. But I think it comes back to the reason why, because I'm like, well, shoot, if if Judas received the morsel, i.e. the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, who, who the Eucharist had just been instituted, he should live forever. But it's not the case, because if we go back to the daily wisdom for today, it says, hear my son and receive my words, and the years of your life shall be many. But here's the thing. Judas did not receive the words of Jesus. Remember I told you, Christ is going to give us very specific words tonight. He's going to give us very specific words from now into eternity. Every Mass you ever go to, you're going to hear these specific words. And if you do not discern, and you do not understand, and if you choose to deny this, you bring condemnation upon you. And, I, and that's ultimately what happened to Judas. That was the mind, you know, the the mind blow. My mind was blown when I was talking to, to Rick about this. So I want to share, I want to share this with you, the Eucharist. Hopefully it'll, it'll, you'll understand what kind of like what's really happening here. And I love this quote that Rick shared with me. He said, the instrument of your destruction will be the instrument of your salvation. And I was just like, unpack that for me. What do you mean by that? He says, well, look at the cross. It's the instrument of our destruction. It's we killed God. But at the same time, it's the same instrument that will bring salvation, that will reunite us back to the Father. Okay. Now, and the reason why I want him to unpack that is because I heard Father Calloway also say, the way you sin will be the way that you are purified. And so when, and so that, that quote, the instrument of your destruction will be the instrument of your salvation. I was like, dude, wh wh where did you, like, unpack that where'd you get that from he says well actually <laughs> that is general zod that's a quote from general zod from the man of steel which we all know the man of steel the story of superman is the story of jesus so i shared this yesterday or maybe the day before 
where God spoke to Adam, right? Adam hid, right? Adam hid, and God called to him, like, where are you, right? Uh, he called to him, where are you? He called to the man. He's like, because you listen to your wife, right? I believe that was the Path of Destruction episode from yesterday. Because you listen to your wife. So and then in the garden, the instrument of our destruction was eating. Was eating. They ate the fruit. So... <laughs> eating of that fruit brought death upon the world. So if eating was ultimately the destruction, was ultimately the instrument of our destruction in the garden, so will be eating, or so will eating be the instrument of our salvation, the Eucharist. It's natural, you know. It's something... Um, it's natural. It's something that, that we want. It's, 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 we need it. We need food to live. So God wrapped in what we want what we need. It's like the garlic story with the little boy and the dog, right? So story goes, you know, little boy, eight years old or so, wants uh, his father to be proud of him. Um, he also wants a dog, so the, the father gets him a dog, and he's like, look, this is going to teach you responsibility, but I need you to take care of it. You need to feed it. You need to walk it. You need to love it, everything. And so he wants to make his father proud, so he works really hard to take care of the dog. Time goes by, you know, the, but the dog starts to get fleas and ticks, and so the boy starts freaking out. He's like, Grandma. He's like freaking out. My, my dad's going to think that I'm not, you know, trustworthy, that I'm not taking care of the dog. He's got fleas. It's got ticks. And the grandma goes, Mijo, all you got to do, here's what you got to do. All you got to do is give the dog garlic. You give the dog garlic and, you know, he'll sweat off and everything. Like the fleas and ticks will go away. So he's like, oh, okay, 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 thank you. So he goes, gives the dog garlic, got, dog refuses it, won't, won't eat it. Comes back to the grandma and said, grandma, the dog won't eat it. I try to give him the garlic. He won't eat it. And the grandmother's like, Mijo, did you like literally try to give him garlic? He's like, yes, that's what you said. She goes, no, 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 no. You got to wrap it in ham. You got to wrap it in ham, and then the dog will eat it. That's us. <laughs> We're the dog. <laughs> Our salvation will come through eating. But you can't just give it to us. It's it's God veiled in the, in the in the what looks like a wafer, right? I mean, think about it. Like people think like. A lot of people, primarily Protestants, where the whole Protestant Reformation happened. The you know there's only one te the one teaching in the Bible. There's one teaching that really divided everything. The one teaching that Christ had that caused his disciples to leave, and that's what I'm going to share with you here in a second. There's only one teaching. Everything he taught, everything else. No, his disciples never left, but there was one teaching where they they left him, and that was the teaching of the Eucharist. So <laughs> they didn't believe. I mean, how many? This was which is why he was crucified. Ultimately, was because of the Eucharist too. They didn't believe he was God. They didn't believe he was God's son. They're like looking at him. They're like, "Aren't you the son of Joseph and Mary? Like, we know where you come from." And many people have that same outlook at the Eucharist. Like it's just a piece of bread. It's a it's a representation. You know, the communion is the representation of the body and blood of Jesus, but it's not actually the body and blood of Jesus, which is what the Catholic Church teaches. And so Jesus veils himself, right? And so ultimately God gives us ultimately what we think we want, food. That way he can give us what we need. And so here is where his apostles ultimately, his disciples actually, ultimately leave him. It's where it's where Judas falls, and why Judas and why Satan entered into him. Okay, so to understand the Eucharist, I highly encourage. You. I'm going to read some of it, bits and pieces of it. 
but you can do your own reading if you want to understand why we teach what we why not we why the church teaches what it teaches on the Eucharist. You have to read John chapter six, and almost everybody I've ever talked to somehow miraculously is not aware of John chapter six. Okay, and it is the bread of life discourse. So it says. You see here. The bread from heaven. So I'm going to read bits bits and pieces of this. I'm just going to really just read. Oh, I'll, I'll do the best I can to skim through this. It says, uh, When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So again, truly, truly. But for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him has God the Father set his seal. So he's prepping them here. I'm getting ready to drop a, I'm getting ready to drop a bomb on you. They said to him, What must we do? to be doing the works of God, Jesus answered them. This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. And so this whole clash between Protestantism and the Catholic Church is faith alone, Bible alone, sola scriptura, you don't need to do anything. And that's true. There's nothing that we can do that's going to, that, there's nothing that we can do to attain our salvation, in a sense. Right. But then in a way, Jesus says, look, you've got to do all these other things if you keep my commandments like he, he goes through like none of this stuff contradicts itself. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat, right? So the Jews wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Um, and God gave them the quail, and he gave them the bread. The manna came down from heaven. They would wake up, and there was this, like, dew across the floor, and it was like these these flakes of bread and quail would come up, and at the end of the day, it would all go away, right? So he provided for them. He goes, but our, you know, we ate the bread, you know, the manna from heaven, but ultimately we died, and then Jesus, here is the first bomb. Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. So he says to them, here we go. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and him who comes to me I will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. So many people stop there. He's like, look, see, Jesus said, all you got to do is believe in him. That's it. Believe, and you're saved. Believe, and that's it. Jesus isn't done yet. The Jews murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, who, whose father and mother we know? How does, he not, how does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Right? So they're like, again, this is people looking at the Eucharist and being like, how, that doesn't look like God. There's no way that's God. That's a representation. That is a, uh, um, 
you know, God's he's speaking metaphorically. No. He doubles down. Jesus answered them, Do not murmur amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except him who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. He's just warming them up because he's getting ready to drop an atomic bomb on them. He's already said, I am the bread of life like three times. So here he goes. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. So here's the thing. So that's why I'm thinking, I'm like, dang, if, 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 Jesus instituted the Eucharist in the room, upper room. He gives it to Judas. Why wouldn't Judas? Ha- why would he not have eternal life? I'm going to get to that. But listen, very important here. Don't believe my words. Believe what Jesus said. He didn't say the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is kind of like my flesh. It's kind of. It's a representation of my flesh. No, Jesus said. I shall get the bread that I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, here's where it all falls apart. And here's where Judas fell. And this is why this is what Rick helped me better understand. Right after that, the Jews the Jews then disputed amongst themselves saying How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So you have to keep in mind, friend, back then, like drinking the blood of an animal was an abomination because the Jews believed the soul, the spirit of that animal was in the blood. Is this starting to sound familiar? Okay. And the eating of the flesh, like actually, and in the Greek, I believe it's like uh, the word that he uses, like, eating of the flesh it's not like chewing like you know chewing it actually the word is like gnawing like you're gnawing like like gnawing on the flesh and so when they hear that they're like this sounds like cannibalism dude (laughs) this sounds like cannibalism blasphemy right this is what gets them killed so they say like how can you give us your flesh to eat like that's an abomination like we're not allowed to do that we're not allowed to drink blood and Jesus doubles down Truly, truly, I say to you. So remember, anywhere we see truly, truly, amen, amen, he's like, no, listen to me. I am telling you. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. I'm going to drop this mic and walk off. Jesus is dropping atomic bombs on these people. He's telling them, eh, you know, if you kind of drink this grape juice and eat this piece of bread, you know, you'll you'll have life. No. He didn't say that. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him 
as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. Bro. He ain't beating around the bush. The Catholic Church is the only church that has the Eucharist. This was a hard teaching for them to understand. And they left. This is the only teaching of all of Jesus' teachings where people leave. And so he tells them, because then they're like, uh, dude, that sounds like freaking cannibalism. He says, this is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. I mean, Jesus ain't goofing around. This he said in the synagogue. <laughs> So Jesus said this in the synagogue. He ain't saying this like out on the side of the, on the street corner. He's in a holy temple teaching this. And then it says, many of his disciples, when they heard it said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Like, dude, I can't hear this. This is wrong. This is blasphemy. This, No, we are not allowed to eat animal flesh. We're not. You're telling us to eat your flesh like I'm going to eat like a, I'm a cannibal. And you want me to drink, drink your blood as an abomination because we believe that in the blood contains the, the soul and the spirit of that person. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured, here's what he tells them. <laughs> so, paint the picture here. Imagine a pastor of a Protestant church, or you with your customers or, or friends or whatever. You say something that offends somebody, and they all start to walk away. What are you going to do? Hey, guys, dude, like, I'm just speaking, like, metaphorically here. I'm just speaking... You know, symbolically, don't don't get your panties in a wad. Like, come back. I didn't really mean it. Look at politicians today. Look at 40,000 denominations of Protestant Christianity. You say something's going to offend your congregation, they start walking away, you're going to reverse yourself. Hold on, guys, come back. I'm just, I'm like, I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically here. No, listen to what Jesus says. <laughs> he says... Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It's like, if you if you have a hard time understanding what I'm telling you verbatim, what are you going to do when you see me literally floating up into the sky to heaven? If you can't believe this, what are you going to do when you see that? He says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you that do not believe. Wow. There are some of you that do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who those were and did not believe and who it was that would betray him Judas was in that crowd Judas was one of the was one of the disciples one of his apostles one of the 12 he knew who's listening he knew Judas doubted Jesus says this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the father so I said this in several episodes ago. I was like, for someone to have faith and believe in the Eucharist, God calls that person to believe that. Someone said something about that, like, in order to have faith that the church that Christ established, 33 AD, the one holy Catholic apostolic church, is the church, the only church, the one true bride of Christ. Like, to, to believe that is a grace. 
And I didn't really understand that until I read this here. He says, this is why I told you no one can come to me unless it's granted him to my father. Like, no one's going to believe th this teaching that I just told you unless you drink my, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Like, no one's going to believe that unless God called you to believe that. Here's the thing. Check it out. John chapter 6, verse 66. So 666, six, six, the only teaching Jesus ever taught where people walked away and left. John 6, 66, it says, After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. They left him. They abandoned him. Jesus said to the twelve, <laughs> Will you also go? Like, Jesus ain't worried. He's not like, hey guys, come back. Come back. I didn't mean it. No. <laughs> he looks at the, the closest ones to him, the twelve. He's like, What's up? You going to take off too? But then Simon Peter, our first pope, says, Lord, to whom shall we go? <laughs> to whom shall we go? Like, you have the words of eternal life. Can you recommend another rabbi then? <laughs> and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you? the 12 and one of you is a devil he spoke of Judas the son of Simon Iscariot for he one of the 12 would betray him and that's why the Satan entered into Judas and I didn't quite connect that dot until Rick my, my mentor brought that to my attention because He received the morsel. He was the first one to receive Holy Communion from Jesus. But he received it unworthily. He re this is where confession comes in. And, you know, Catholics get, you know, kicked around the dirt a lot because of confession. It's not a, you know, it's, that's not the way to fear salvation, blah, blah, blah. And we'll get into the, the teaching of that another day, too. But you need to examine your conscience. You cannot be in a state of sin. You cannot be in a state of mortal sin and receive the body and blood of Jesus. Otherwise, you bring condemnation upon you. Okay, and I'm going to, St. Paul says this. I'm going to read it to you. So Judas didn't believe. Remember, it says, I just read it to you. He did not believe. And because he did not discern, he did not believe in the Eucharist. Did not believe in it. And then he consumed the Eucharist. He brought condemnation upon himself, and Satan entered him. So, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. You could actually back up to 23, but I'm just going to start at 27, because it's about the institution of the Eucharist. Ah, you know what, I'll back up, because the church is all about, it teaches tradition, and St. Paul is telling us the importance of tradition. So, chapter 11. Verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also to what I also delivered to you, tradition. What I've received from God, I am also teaching to you. And that reminds me of my, my wisdom for the day. How many men have not heard the wisdom from their father? How many men grew up without their father passing his knowledge to them, continuing the tradition? Many men don't. I didn't. But Paul's saying here, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. He, that's tradition right there. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Quote, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So do this. Christ is giving us a command, a commandment. And according to today's wisdom, he's saying, hear my son and receive my words. Receive my words. Do you receive my words when I tell you this is, the this is my body, blood, soul, and divinity? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Do you? That's what the wisdom is telling me today. Do I receive those words? 
Because if I do, it closes with, the years of your life shall be many. And so St. Paul is saying here, he's quoting Jesus, do this in memory, That's, that is a command. In the same way, also the chalice, after supper saying, quote, he's quoting Jesus here, this chalice is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the chalice, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So that right there is a tease for the the importance of date going to Mass daily, receiving the Eucharist as often as possible. I do a terrible job of that. I had a good not sprint, but I had a good habit where I was, I went to daily mass for six months straight. Schedule has changed a bit, and now it, it's just hard for me to get there. But he's saying, for as often as you receive this. And then here's the bomb. Here's where it ties into Judas 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. How can you profane the body and blood of the Lord if it's just a wafer? If it's just a piece of bread and it's grape juice, it's it's wine. If, if that's all that it is, if that's all that it is, if it is not the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if it is not that, that Jesus just said, if it is not that, then how can we be guilty of profaning against his body? It says, let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Examine himself. So before this is saying that you need to be in a state of grace before you can receive the Eucharist. This is where confession comes in. Make an examination of your conscience, seek reconciliation, and do penance. That's what we're being called to. That's what St. Paul is telling us here. He says, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we have chastened, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So he's saying, this is why many of you have suffered. Many of you have died. We've died spiritually. This is why many of you have died spiritually. We've condemned ourselves, and that's what happened with Judas. He condemned himself because he did not believe in the Eucharist. He did not believe in what Jesus said. He doubted and still received the Eucharist. And because of that, as a result, as a consequence, Satan entered him, making it easier for him to betray Jesus. So, dude... If you're a Christian, and if you're a Catholic, do you believe in the Eucharist? Based off everything that I've just shown you, I've, I've given you the evidence. If yes, let me know why in the comments. If no, and you think I'm full of crap, <laughs> let me know in the comments. Damn, 53-minute episode. That's all I got today, man. Thanks for watching. Appreciate you being here. See you on the next one. Peace.